volatility in oil prices and U.S. Treasury yields seems to be going hand in hand. What should investors really make of it? Let's find out more from Chris Weston of IG Markets. He is our guest host. Chris, very nice to see you. Pleasure to be here. So what do you think um, of the environment out there? Certainly we are starting to see Treasury yields pick up, where, whereas the rest of the world seems to be in a very negative world. Well, um, we've started to see U.S. yields moving up a little bit. I suppose that that really comes off to the back of the strong non-farm payrolls the mm. other day. Uh, if you look at the front end, which of course encapsulate the rate expectations much more than the back end, uh, we've started seeing a move back above, above that 60 basis point mark. Spreads against German yields, German bunds have ballooned out to the largest they've been in quite some time. And of course that's pushed the dollar higher. I mean that really throws up anyone who's been issuing debt in, in, in U.S. dollar denominated terms, a lot of emerging markets, you know, they're going to be quite concerned about what's happening. China going to be quite concerned about what's happening with the, with the, with spreads as well. Uh, but I think it shows what's happening globally at the moment as well. This massive divergence mm. that's taking place at a central bank level. The Federal Reserve, if you look at market pricing, they're suggesting the Fed will start raising rates in September. The primary dealers, the guys who deal directly with the Fed, maybe July. Um, some people are saying that What is that going to mean for Asia? Because, you know, whenever rates go higher, whenever the dollar gets stronger, Asia has had a nasty experience. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that, you know, a lot of Asia has addressed that issue much better. They've looked at ways of, of controlling their deficit. If they were running a really high... Um, uh, deficit, then, then I think you probably would have seen what we saw in 2012 with the 2000 with the tam uh, taper tantrum and mm. emerging markets being hit. But I think they've addressed that situation so really no well. So no mini tantrum as well, we get into mid year. <laughs> I think the concern that I've got at the moment is what happens in China specifically. If you look at what's happening in the Remimbi, and I think mm. it's not really getting as much focus as, as perhaps they should do. Um, the Remimbi at the moment is being driven by U.S. dollar, uh, U.S. Treasury two-year spreads against Chinese two-year spreads as the U.S. Uh, uh, Treasury premium or uh, declines, or sorry, the, the Chinese premium declines against that of the US, you know, the currency reacts. Yeah. If the premium increases for China, we see flows into China and that strengthens the renminbi. If the US premium or d d um, discount actually um, decreases, you will see money flowing out of China. So that spread to me is very interesting. And the Chinese, if you look at what's happening with their currency, right. they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Right. They can't decrease their currency significantly. If you look at what we saw in Q4, we saw massive capital outflows, something like $91 billion. So that acts as a kind of quasi-tightening of financial mm. conditions, which of course That's aids the slowdown. That's why a lot of people have been looking very closely at the renminbi, but it really hasn't done much. No, and I think that's the absolute policy for, for the Chinese right now. The, the concern they've got, of course, is that they are losing out in this sort of global currency war. A slower China, does that uh, go hand in hand with a slowing Europe as well? I mean, how, is Mario Draghi's uh, QE baked into the pie? I want to bring up Euro bring Europe into the picture because yeah. they have so much uh, going on between uh, the two regions. Well, they are. I mean, yeah, China has, is, a, is a major trade um, a major trade destination is Europe, and, and Europe, as we know, is slowing down, and you know, there's talk of recessions and, and whatnot continuing, and you know, we've got deflation outright coming through there. I, I mean, I don't personally believe that QE is going to work in Europe. Uh, if you look at what's happening in European banks, they are lending, they yeah, yeah. Say, but they're, they're lending mostly to abroad. Mm. Um, you know, the savings rates are still far too high in, in Europe, and they're not willing to take on, on, on like that additional credit at the moment. If you look at the current flows that we're seeing, cross-border of flows. Yeah, banks are lending, as I say, but they're lending abroad, and, and, and that's creating euro outflows as well. A lot of that money is making its way into the US, where you can you, know, you can effectively still park money with the, the central bank and get a, what's it, a 10 or 25 basis point return or so. That's a lot, considering well, the environment the moment, yeah, and You can go and hand it over to the Swiss National Bank and pay, <laughs> and pay them 75 basis points for the privilege of doing that as well. Um, but I think QE, yeah, QE, I think, in its current form of 60 billion isn't going to work. I think the market's telling me it's not going to work. Why? Because we look at the so-called five-year, five-year swaps, yeah, yeah. which is what the ECB have told us to look at. Right. Um, and through this whole process of is the ECB going to enact on QE and finally being told that we are going to see 60 billion in public and private assets, the rate expectations or inflation expectations have actually maintained at 1.55%. So mm. it's still well below the 2% threshold that they need. So that tells me the market is saying that QE under its current form fine, you've got to look at oil as well because it's part right, of the CPI right. basket, is not going to create inflation.